one of the things about being white is that you usually stand up in front of an entirely, almost entirely white audience. And today I'm not doing that, and I'm aware of my own fragility here, thinking this is quite scary. And I'm thinking we have to, we have to sort of personally reflect on the ways in which these things affect us. Um, Phil Thomas and myself started to think about what it means for us to be white about three or four months ago, and we are in the process of writing something together, and we're taking our time over that, and this presentation came out of those thinking, that thinking. And so um, the plan was for Phil to speak first. As an ex-psychiatrist, retired psychiatrist, but very much a critical thinker, um, about whiteness, and then I'm talking from the point of view of a white service user survivor. I'm no longer a current user of mental health services, but I have been in hospital <clears throat> on a number of occasions in North London alongside many, many black service users and black staff. And um, I have subsequently um, worked as a researcher in mental health charities. So I am going to start with this little bit of personal reflection, although I'm sure none of you wants to hear um, the awakenings of a white person about racism. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of history, uh, some acknowledgments to people who've really made a, an impression on me, and some turning points in my recent um, thinking that made me start to do more thinking about this and something about the future. My first ever piece of research work in mental health was looking at Section 136 of the Mental Health Act, which was, I mean, absolutely the, the perfect, I was going to say, the epitome of intersection of these race issues. Um, racism in the police, racism in society, because we were quite clear that often the police were called by uh, members of the public to, um, place, to, to, to intervene in situations. Racism in psychiatry and um, racism within the people, fellow people on the wards. I mean, I can remember interviewing one black um, man who had been picked up under Section 136 of the Mental Health Act, and the, neither the police nor the psychiatrist believed that he had a job in construction in the city. We didn't actually manage to interview very many people um, service users at that time, patients who'd been detained, which wasn't really very surprising, I think, because very often people had only just been picked up by the police, were in hospital uh, in a state of sort of shock and distress. And I don't know if you can imagine me with my little briefcase turning up to interview um, a black man in hospital, but I don't think that the image quite sort of lends itself to very good ethical quality research. Um, sort of fast forwarding a few years, I, I did some really valuable, what I believed to be valuable work um, at the Mental Health Foundation, and this um, was a report of that research. And I suppose it's part of maturity, being able to be critical about your own work and thinking back and looking at, yeah, we employed a couple of interviewers, one of whom is about to speak after the coffee break, Colin. Um, to uh, interview their fellow um, black, African Caribbean and South Asian uh, fellow uh, participants in the research. So we published a report and we, um, and I think, I think what I believed um, in those days was that a sense of, an innate sense of fairness and social justice, which I came to all of my work with, was enough. And I know, I know now that it it actually wasn't, and this is a quotation from Colin in that report, which I think is, is, is kind of a part of this learning journey for me and for other, I hope, for other white survivors, white researchers. Um, but if, if, if as an interviewer employed on a research project, you go in and you feel like you're a spy on your own community, um, that also isn't the best way to do research. In relating these experiences, I'm describing a move within myself from inclusion towards partnership, from thinking about race and racism to thinking about white privilege, 
from thinking about including BME survivors, service users as participants in a research project, to actually recognizing that people are fellow knowledge producers and knowers in the process. And Suman mentioned a number of things that, that actually really resonated for me. One of them was about getting shorter as, you're, as you get older. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, ni neither he nor I seem to start off with very much <laughs> height <laughs> in the first place. Um, but one of, one of the things that he mentioned was about white knowledge. And I think in the survivor world, in the service user world, this is also the case. And I think that's one of the things that I've been reflecting on most um, in the last sort of few months and thinking about, um, you know, how do, we, how do we work against that? How do we make sure that we're working with people to change that whiteness? These are two people who made an enormous impact on me. Um, one is a friend, a friend and mentor, I would call Jayshree um, Kalatil, and Colin, who doesn't probably even realize the impact he's had on me, but because of the history that we had that traces right back to the Strategies for Living Research, and a recent event that I'm going to tell you about as well. Um, these are two people, survivors, both of them, um, who have had an enormous impact on me. There was a turning point for me um, in 2015, an event um, about survivor research, tracing the history of survivor research. So, you know, here we are acknowledging that service users have got knowledge to um, connect with the side disciplines. Service users have their own knowledge that is about mental health from a different perspective from the side disciplines. We are influenced by the side disciplines and we're clearly influenced by institutional racism as well. So we talk very frequently, as many, some researchers do, about being diverse and inclusive. And Jayshree gave a presentation that day in which she said, survivor research is still by and large a homogenous place which reflects little of the vast array of different experiences, identities, skills, and backgrounds that constitute the larger user-survivor community. She said, this room today reflects this fact. The room was white with the exception of about, I don't know, three or four people. I can't, I can't be, remember numbers. But following her presentation, that's what happened. And I have never, I, I think emotionally never um, experienced it in quite the way I did that day. Um, one person did speak from the audience. Um, black man, surprisingly. None, none of the white fellow panel members responded to her, not one. And I'm, you know, I feel almost, I feel quite emotional just relating it now. Um, but basically, it was a very powerful day in which I, I, I took it into me to think, how can I do things differently in the future? And then one year later, there, we had an event with the Survivor Researcher Network where we, de -center, we attempted to decenter whiteness and I will never forget Colin's presentation that day. I hope you're in for a treat today, later on, um, because it made a huge impact on me. And he, one of the things he has said uh, many times is that whiteness itself must not escape structural scrutiny. But what does it mean, though, to be white means very often, to, and I've heard this just recently, to be the reference population in research, the reference population, the norm against which the other is measured. To be white means not having to think about your race every single day. It means going unnoticed into a room full of white people. It opens doors to work and opportunities, both within academia and elsewhere. For a freelance survivor researcher like myself, now I don't have a lot of power. I don't believe myself to have a lot of power. I don't have money. I don't have a budget of any kind. I need work. But it, what it does mean is that I am offered work on a range of topics. I'm not selected just for work that matches my racial group because it's assumed that my work will simply be the mainstream, the norm, the reference population. I am the neutral, the mainstream, the define, one of the definers of the, the space. Um, you know, I'm sure many people are familiar with that, the concept of the white knapsack that we white people carry around with us of special privileges, maps, passports, code books. Uh, and that kind of, that image still resonates very much for me, I guess, in thinking about all of this. You'll see my thinking is not that very advanced yet. I'm on a journey. I recognize that I'm on a journey and that I've got a long way to go yet. 
But I'm, what the most that I could hope for, actually, just to, to, is that some people will go on that journey with me. I'm not going to go on it. I, I don't want to go on it on my own, because what would be the point of that, really? Um, white fragility was something I've now read about um, quite a lot and realized that it's all around me, it's within me, it's around me. Um, a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves such as anger, fear, guilt. And I do feel those things and I want to be honest about that and also try not to act that out. Um, because these behaviors, if we act on them, they, they reinstate that white racial equilibrium. So, so more silence, please, in other words. You know, let's not talk about it because it's too difficult and too complicated. Um, this, again, is part of Jayashree Kalatil's uh, presentation on that day at St. George's, and I think it serves as a, a useful sort of introduction to the future um, because she says that race and racism is an issue for all of us. We all need to talk about it. Uh, white people need to get better at talking about it, basically. How knowledge is produced and who is involved in it. Um, survivor research. If, if it will just continue to be the same uh, if, we cannot, if we cannot start talking about those difference and intersections of experience, we will just simply continue to perpetuate the systems of inequality that are already there. So it's not just about, I think, diagnosis or the side disciplines. It's all around us. It's within all of us that we have to think about these. For myself then, well, more thinking, talking and reading, being prepared to challenge, because there are many, there are times when I'm invited to speak. What am I saying? There are loads of times when I speak on panels of white, with white people talking to other white people about all sorts of things in mental health. Um, but being prepared to challenge and thinking about what that means. I think it means that maybe not, maybe sometimes it's not just the black people that have to do the challenging, because if we can do the challenging too, we take some of that burden away, because I think if we always expect the, the black individuals in a group to do that challenging, then we're leaving them in a position of being then marginalized further and taking all of the responsibility away from us. And then they become the troublemakers. And Thank you. Um, I think in the work where I have worked in partnership with people, I have got a greater, better understanding of the theoretical underpinnings to what we do in mental health. And that has been a huge addition to my work. Um, I need to recognize, continue recognizing my own power and privilege and using it when I can. And I guess for all of us, it's about tolerating the messiness of all these inconvenient complications that affect us. Thank you. <laughs>